make a start. Welcome to this webinar, um, this wonderful webinar with Gray and Rob um, from Gray and Rob Associates, where we will be really looking at how they have used Belbin um, as part of their work with the Clipper Race, and also how they then made the transition um, from doing put lots of stuff outside um, face to face to, as we all have, had to make this transition to this new virtual way of working. A bit of housekeeping before we start. Please scroll right to the top of the chat because all of the rules are there. Yes, we're sending a video. If you want to chat, please do, but make sure that you put the link to everybody, not just us panelists. Any questions, please put in the Q&A and we'll try and answer as many questions throughout the session as possible. Any that we don't, we'll ask at the end. And then if we still have some left over, we will obviously um, catch up with you individually. So that's that, that's that, that's that. Oh, my name's Joe Keeler and I'm Managing Director, um, not Managing Director at all, that's completely the wrong title. I'm Managing Partner here at Belbin. <laughs> Starting so well, Graham, it really is. Um, and have been here for about 20 years. So I've um, been here a while now, but not as long as Graham. So Graham has been part of the Belbin family for well over 30 years, would you say now? I think it is, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, so right at the very, very beginning, Graham was very much part of what we were doing at Belbin and really embraced the model and the reports and everything and has made some brilliant, um, had done some brilliant work with those, with organisations around the world. Um, I'm just reading now, Graham, if you don't mind, because I'm reading off your sheet because I want to get this right. So there's nothing worse than, than not. Um, <laughs> okay, so, don't worry. No, no, I am. I'm going to try and get it right. So you've got 30 years experience in leadership and, and team development, lots of organisational development work and strategic consulting. And I know I've heard you speak at a few of our conferences before. And they know the work that you're doing is really, really interesting. Um, we had some really great um, business results from there. Um, so you set up Graham Rob Associates back in 1989. And of course, also... Melbourne, France in 1994. So this is how much experience we have with us on this on this webinar today. Right. I'm going to let you introduce yourself a little bit more after that. Um, can I just say that there could be a little bit of hostility between us because I've just read that Graham is a Norwich City fan. You're not an I, Ipswich supporter. I am. Oh, <laughs> Suffolk. I am. I know. It could all go horribly wrong now. Um, so just to say <laughs> that if we do fall out, it's purely um, about football. Um, mm. Obviously, I hope that translates um, to everybody. But rivals, rival in the football. Right, Graham, you have not joined us before for a webinar. So actually, what happens now before I allow you to do any speaking? Um, and don't worry, I will allow you to say something. Is what we're going to do is use the language of Belbin to be able to predict the way in which we would work together. Because that's the wonderful thing about Belbin, isn't it? Is that it allows you to predict performance. So in my incredibly high tech, <laughs> I love this, high tech way, let's get this team roll circle here. So for those of you who know Belbin, this will be quite familiar. We've got the social roles here, which are those resource investigator, the team worker and the coordinator. It's slightly out, I can see with a bit of glare, but here we have the action roles. We have the shaper, the completer finisher and the implementer. And here on this side are the thinking and they are the plant, the monitor evaluator and the specialist. We all have a bit of all of these team roles we are not just one or two things. We're a myriad of all of these, but we tend to have strengths, preferences in two or three of these roles. We then also can manage two or three, and then the other ones at the bottom of our profiles, we really do need to delegate. So that's why it's so important to find people who are different to you. Right. Okay, I'm just reading here, actually, Graham, that we've got some other Ipswich supporters on the chat. So you're oh out yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah, you're <laughs> Is there London. any Norwich supporters out there? No, no, there's not. Okay, so <laughs> Graham, you're the guest. So what I'd love to share you to share with us are your top three Melbourne team or strengths. Okay, so my top one is resource investigator. Brilliant. There you go there. Then plant. Oh, okay. Then shaper. Okay. So idea factory be original, problem solving, really creative, or quite happily found elsewhere and brought back in, along with lots of drive. 
and we were talking earlier, we started having a competition about who was the most competitive, which um, explains <laughs> the shape a little bit, doesn't it? Um, You're an Ipswich supporter, so you can't be. Oh, no, that's <laughs> fair point, fair point. Um, so with lots of drive, lots of ideas. So let's put myself up here. So we share this, which we know due to the fact of how long our meetings go on for. Um, I also have strong coordinator. So the coordinator is the one that looks at the bigger picture. I also have high shaper. So yes, this could potentially be fun, Jonathan, you're quite right. Um, we have two high shapers. So we're both going to potentially, and this is the thing, isn't it? It's potentially be fighting for a little bit of airtime, perhaps. And we want that airtime because we're both rather talkative. Mm -hmm. So like because, shy retiring flowers. Aren't we just? You never get our <laughs> opinions on anything. Um, so what I'm going to try and do, and this is the wonderful thing about Belman, if we were just to say, that's it, it would be useful, it would predict. But what we want to make sure is it's next, you know, 45, 50 minutes or so is as productive as possible. So what I'm going to do, Graham, is that because you're the guest, I'm going to come off here, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to try and double up on my coordinator to ensure that everything that you need to say is said and to ensure that I can just rein you in a bit if we suddenly find that we've finished 10 minutes in, okay? Okay. What's more important is what's your bottom role, Graham? Complete a finisher. And as everybody else knows, <laughs> it's mine too. Yeah, this could be difficult, but actually I love this because for the first time we were really conscious of this, weren't we? is behind the scenes. I've got Peter Lancaster, who was a high completer finisher. Um, you've got Matt, who's a high completer finisher. So we've both got somebody behind the scenes here looking at the detail and checking that everything is going okay. Graham, would you like to comment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's exciting. It's gonna be fun and full of enthusiasm, hopefully. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited about the things we do and really excited about Belbin too. So Fab. I'm looking forward to it. Let's utilise your RI, Graham. Let's go for it. Right, I'm just going to gracefully put that over there. I was quickly remembering that I didn't have my jeans on, so that was quite good. <laughs> okay, so let's begin. Graham Rob, from Managing Director of Graham Rob Associates, you have been working with the Clipper race. Now, I'm not so hot on boats and racing and all of these things. So please, can you set the scene and tell us what the Clipper race is all about, please? Okay, so, I mean, it might be helpful just to have a look at a few slides here um, uh, when, we, when we kick off. So the Clipper uh, around the world yacht race is the ultimate leadership and team challenge. Um, it was designed by Sir Robin Knox, who single-handedly circumnavigated the world um, back in 1962. So this is Sir Robin. Uh, he's in his 80s now, and he's incredibly fit. He attends all the different locations around the world, and you just hear incredible stories about him. So um, Clipper was founded in 1996, and there's been several... Um, well, three generations of people going around the world on the Clipper yachts. The massively exciting thing about the Clipper race is that the only qualified professionals on the yachts are 11 identical yachts. And there's a few statistics here. So these were the 1920 statistics. Um, so six ocean crossings, 700 crew, and they're spread across 11 yachts. Now, there's only 20 to 24 people on a yacht at any time. Um, so each leg, uh, the, the crew changes. Now, there are about nine or 10 circumnavigators on each yacht. The other 10 to 14 people uh, change. Now, they might be on for a couple of legs, a single legs, a single leg. Um, there are 44 different nationalities. The age range goes from 18 through to 70. Uh, they touch or intended to touch six continents. Uh, they all have some professional training or some, some sailing training before they go, 
but the exciting thing is that they are all amateurs apart from uh, the skipper and what's known as the AQP or the first mate. So AQP stands for additional qualified person. Um, there are 15 different races and obviously because there's 11 yachts, there's 11 skippers and AQPs. So if we can just flick to the next slide, that um, this shows the route. Uh, so it started in St. Catherine's Dock where the number one is, round to Portugal, uh, then Uruguay, Cape Town, Fremantle in Eastern Australia and um, then Western Australia. And that's where the problems started uh, when they were on the way to China. Basically, that's when COVID cut in. So they had to stop the race there. They did um, uh, a quick re-navigation and got the boats to um, the Philippines. In the Philippines. Uh, yeah. Mm. And um, that's where the boats still are. Uh, all the skippers are back with the exception of one called Geronimo, and you'll hear from Geronimo a little bit later. I love his name. And um, so unfortunately, um, the, the race stopped pretty much halfway around. It should have started, well, it started in August 19, should have finished in August 20 in London. Um, but we don't know when it's going to restart. So, so can I just check here? Because I think I think this is a bit that I was a little bit amazed about. <coughs> is that if I had the money and also the desire, um, I could sign up and become a member of the crew for, for not obviously this year, but at some point they just made up of ordinary people who wanted to have their own challenges or their own experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's just ordinary people making up the crews. Yeah. So those ordinary people... Uh, often, I mean, it's quite expensive. This is the sailing equivalent of climbing Everest. So okay. it's, as, it's as challenging. And I've climbed base camp Everest and Kilimanjaro, but climbing Everest is another kettle of fish. And this sailing experience is the ultimate. Now, if you can imagine uh, 24 people being on a 70 foot yacht, we can show you some of the living conditions. Oh, do, because I'm quite excited, actually. I think I might. It sounds a bit. So the galley is the top left hand corner. Uh, the heads or loos as they are on board. That is the loo. The guy is about to clean with his rubber glove. Um, and uh, yeah, sort of outside on deck, the navigation area and the sleeping quarters. Um, which is obviously the hammock. Now they hot bunk because um, the boat generally is uh, on, on an angle of about 45 degrees most of the time. So it makes sense to be on the dry side rather than the wet side. So one person get up, gets up to start their watch, the other one um, takes over. Now, <laughs> 24 people being in those cramped living conditions um no. yeah you can imagine no. it's, there is one loo with uh, a plastic curtain in front because they don't want to carry any excess weight uh so it's it's very very tough my goodness so you've got people who have volunteered they've paid to actually be on there um how long how long is a typically one leg sorry you did say but i completely forgot how uh, long does it take it, it, it varies i mean it can be okay. up to 30 day, days on a leg and um, apparently when the customs guys get on, they don't stay on long um, because you can imagine 24 people living in those living conditions. They haven't really had showers for that period of time. Ooh. So when they come on to check the paperwork, uh, they generally get off pretty quickly. So it's quite uh, ripe, I think the expression yeah. is, isn't it? it must it be is. quite ripe. OK, so you've got these people on board. And the only people really who are the, the, the qualified people who obviously um, already, you know, good, good leaders are, are the skippers. Mm -hmm. And the, I have to get my terminology right, the AQPs, the additional qualified persons. Yeah. So tell me a bit more about them, because my goodness, the job that they must have is quite phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, if you can imagine, um, basically there's 11 yachts going around the world that are like 11 um, companies uh, mm -hmm. with different people on board and uh, every 
human challenge that you could ever imagine mm. happening in an organization probably happens on these boats. And, uh, you know, the boats are identical and uh, it's just the people that make the difference. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a race, but not everybody wants to win the race. So it's pretty important that uh, the skippers and AQP, AQPs establish the culture that they want right at the outset. And one of the things, well, dealing with all those human problems um, is incredibly difficult. These are professional sailors. Uh, last year was the first time they had AQPs. Up till then, it was just the, the so skipper. Just on one person before yeah. now. Yeah, so the Marine Safety Agency said that they needed an additional qualified person. So this is the first time we've had duos, um, leadership duos, um, as as part of the crew. Both of them are pro professionally qualified. Um, but they need to engage everybody, don't they? I'm just trying to think. You're, you're saying here it's like an organisation. Well, in an organisation, if you really aren't getting or gelling with the team that you're with... You can yep. just go, you know, I'm, I'm not here anymore. Um, or you can go and speak to somebody or, but you can't do that, can you? No. And I mean, you, if you imagine that um, it's very expensive uh, to circumnavigate, it's the equivalent, I think, of climbing Everest. So it's in excess of £50,000 to wow. circumnavigate. So legs are, you know, much cheaper, I think, between seven and 9000 or something. So... Um, but for people to be able to afford uh, 50,000, generally they've uh, achieved, they've been pretty successful in their work life. So you get a lot of managing directors, uh, a lot of people who've been around run, run their own companies and are fairly dominant. And if you can imagine, some of the skippers are quite young. So I think the youngest was 24. And in the last race, there were two women that won and one of those women who came second was 24. So wow. 24 managing rough, tough, seasoned guys who are generally, it, it is guys because there's more men than women. Mm -hmm. This time we couldn't find any, any women um, to, uh, to be skippers just because the population of um, qualified skippers is, is much less. So, you know, if you can imagine a 24-year-old coping and managing these pretty yeah. senior people uh, around the world and at each leg you might have an awesome team that mm -hmm. are doing phenomenally well and then uh, your crew changes so, so you keep your you circum yeah yeah and 44 different nationalities so you know do they is there is their English good um, you know it's just it's just incredible so wow. Uh, one of the crews spent most of the time on the first leg coaching their people to be good across all the different functions on the yacht. And that paid dividends much further down the line. So if you've got coaches who could okay. then coach other people, mm. that made absolute sense. So, and part of the thing we did with them was to get them thinking about how they were going to establish the culture of, of their yacht right at the outset. So that's one of the things we looked at. Thank you for that. Um, see, I, when we first, I thought, God, that sounds really exciting. And the more I'm hearing about it, the less I think I'm, I'm, I want to actually be involved. But what you've really illustrated here, you've set the scene beautifully, is the importance of the skipper mm -hmm. and the importance of the AQP and also the importance of the relationship between um what i'd like to do now though is before we go any further can i can i share the clip can i can yeah, i yeah. please can yeah. i so i've got a clip here because i've i don't know about in your head but i've got like, like blue skies i've got everybody sitting over the side you know with the shoes off you know dolphins going past i've got everything sort of okay they're a bit cramped but it still might be quite a nice jolly sort of duran duran video type thing yeah showing my age now um <laughs> But Graham then sh showed me this. I said, we have to show this because I think this really does put some perspective in there. So I'm just going to share my screen. Share completed sound. Tick, tick. Um, where are we? We're here. Just listen. Listen. 
this. Yesterday we were uh, sailing along, 24 hours out from finishing the race. Come across a few occluded fronts, as they call them in the local area, cigar uh, fronts. We experienced between 60 to, to 80 knot squalls coming through. One final test after 5,000 miles. our tack line in time which resulted in I put this nicely the explosion of our code 2 kite uh, good effort from everybody to, to get it down what can I say about the weather lightning pretty much throughout the entire evening um, fork lightning all throughout the sky for 12 hours or so challenging scenario. Okay, I'm just going to stop sharing that. That, that puts it in perspective, doesn't it? I, I still, my heart race, it's, it's, my heartbeat goes up. It really is. You're thinking, wow, mm. this is proper serious situation where you have got to get that team functioning. Yep. No, it's, I mean, it's enormously, I mean, there are obviously quieter times and when they go across the doldrums, there's no wind at all. And, um, you know, they can sit around for days, perhaps, um, and they are allowed to use their motors then. But it, uh, there are several occasions when it's really, really tough and incredibly mm. demanding. And, um, you know, I, I sort of take my hat off to the Clipper team because they are fantastic. They are incredibly well organized. Every port they go into, it's fantastically well organized. When they set off from London, it was just so emotional because they choose their own uh, music to leave the, the um, St. Catherine's dock by. And each one goes out into the lock in turn into the Thames. And then they parade up the Thames. They lift Tower Bridge and uh, come wow. come back again and uh yeah it's just so emotional that because uh, they're you know they're waving everybody off all their families yeah. and what have you so incredible i'd just like to say looking at the chat here please don't you'll get distracted i don't think anybody um really wants to go on it <laughs> <laughs> Kate, on with you i could not do that it is but this leads us back to all of that doesn't happen overnight all of that, be it going on with your, you know, with your music and being proud as you start, being able to have things like trust, culture, all of these things aren't a given. And we all know that, don't we? We all know how hard it is to do that. But here it's critical. So what was the role of Graham Robb Associates here? What did you do? And I did see your name this time. You're on the, on the is it the boom? That thing yeah, that goes yeah. over? Yeah, yeah. And did check your logo was on there as it was going into the water and almost capsizing. Um, what part did you play? Because, I mean, these skippers are already, you know, they've, they've already got leadership skills. OK, mm. so it's not as if you're starting from scratch. These are experienced skippers. They're, the, you know, the best at what they already do. So do you want to take us a little bit through the process of how you helped these skippers and these um, additional qualified persons to be able to do what they did? Yeah, um, 
I mean, basically, Clipper approached us in in the January and said, would we be interested in helping them? Because we, we'd we worked with quite a few elite sports teams, well, women's rugby, mm -hmm. the national team, women's cricket, the national team, women's football, as well as we'd supported two sailing um, teams in two lots of Olympics. Um, and we'd also worked with the England football teams and uh, uh, various other professional teams and referees so they approached us and said would we be interested and we said yeah we would we would love to so the skippers are recruited around May and they are full on from May till the start of the race every day it's pretty much six days a week so they said to us we can only afford to let you have the skippers and AQPs for about six or seven days uh, four or five days of skipper time and two or three days of uh, AQPs and skippers together. So we have a leadership centre just outside Reading and um, it's a 15 acre site and we've got lots and lots of different challenges there like climbing, climbing walls and jumping off telegraph poles and things like that. But it's not about being macho. This is really about equipping people to cope with all the people problems that they can encounter on those yachts. And a test of our success would be, uh, Sarah is one of the race organizers and she said she spends most of her time in port sorting problems, people problems. Um, so, so, so she said the test of our ability or our success would be, would she not be in demand when she got in the port? <laughs> uh, that, that was kind of a tall order, but, um, but we spent, five or six days we did things we used Belbin we Belbin them all um, and we used observer feedback uh, we used situational leadership because we believe that would help them um, do the coaching so these are some of the module uh, modules we're obviously trained on crucial conversations as well because there are some high stakes wow. conversations that happen um, and you know when you've got opposing opinions which generates strong emotions and the stakes are high and you've seen some of the stakes from that video uh, yes. uh, and you know it's really really important to try and equip the skippers uh, with you know with the skills to deal with those crucial conversations um, so we profiled them all uh, we did a whole series of different leadership tasks and we used the action-centered leadership uh, model as well so each leader would be given a brief, they'd have a task to perform, uh, they perform the task. At the end of the task, the leader was asked how um, they felt it had gone. Uh, the team said how they felt it had gone. Uh, there's an observer appointed from within the team who doesn't participate, but just observes what's going on. And then they give their feedback about what factually happened. And then if there's anything left to say, we would chip in uh, with our observations so it was all about developing leadership about developing team skills mm. um, and we also uh, did quite a lot of work on building their resilience as well which is our own model of the emotional landscape um, just in terms of the people challenges probably just worth uh, yeah. well these are all the modules that I think is coming up on the next slide but is it uh, I don't know yeah that's it here we go so these, we touched on all of these things. Now, the other thing, they, they need to build this culture. Now, some people probably have the perception that Joe had that I'm just going for a holiday and I'm going to dangle my feet over, yeah. um, uh, over the side of the boat. Um, <laughs> but others really, really want to compete to win. So somehow you've got to harness all the different expectations mm. and agree a vision for each, each of those different yachts. So we took them through how they could build a vision and also how they could present that vision to, uh, to, to the crews. They have a crew allocation day when okay. they find out who is in the crew and they fill Portsmouth Guildhall and that each skipper comes up on the stage and then they get told wow. who their crew is. And... So we've got a question here, actually, which I'd like to ask you right now, because it's, it's very relevant um, from Maria. And she said the individual motivation must be quite high as everybody's sort of paid to be there. So does that make it any easier 
for the leaders or the skippers? Uh, well, I, I, uh, wow, that's that's a good question. I, I think it's just so diverse because, um, you know, motivation dippers. I heard of one guy who was sick the whole leg. He never got out of his hammock. He oh, just, no. So I'm not sure how his motivation would have been or the yeah. motivation of the people when they were trying to sleep. And this poor guy is retching most of the 30 oh. days. So oh. people got when they left London, uh, the weather was pretty bad, and a lot of people were incredibly sick. And I've so never they may been... start with the same motivation, but it yeah, but it's it how doesn't... do you keep that going? And wow. yeah. people have highs and lows as well. And you know, all the people challenges they get homesick, they miss their families, their kids. Um, you know, there's conflicts on board. People don't speak to each other. All of those things. So all the normal different. stuff you'd have, but the fact is you can't escape. Yeah. You can't escape. You're not going home at 5.30. Yeah. You're not moaning to HR. You're not doing all of these things because you've got to stay together. So you may all start whooping. Come on, we can do this. But actually the reality then sets in yeah. and means that actually motivations change. Somebody could just be, I just want to be able to not be sick for the next 12 hours. I want to be able to eat might become the motivation. So you're going right down to Maslow, aren't you? You're going right yeah, yeah. down to the hierarchy of needs. So the, the, the theme I'm getting from this is the, the importance of the skipper and the additional qualified person, because what you need to do is obviously these are people who've got you know, incredible qualifications and experience, but they need to know more about them because this is leadership, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To be a great leader, to be able to motivate and inspire trust to your team that's just happened, you've just been given them um, at the Guildhall. You need to know yourself pretty well. And yeah. I suppose this is where where Belbin came in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we you've already said we've been using Belbin for 30 years. We're, I mean, we're qualified on lots of other instruments, but our first choice is always Belbin. And so Belbin has been at the cornerstone of our business for 30 years. We have done thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of profiles across the globe from very senior people down to um you know the most the most junior people so we've done deep slice teams from the top to the bottom and horizontal teams as well um you know i think the thing i like about belbin is people people trust it and um you know we do all of the normal profiling we share all the profiles on the circle and put strengths and weaknesses in and what i tried to do is 30 seconds to a minute on each person and then say what do you think is 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 that how you see yourself mm -hmm. and often it's if there's a team of people that know them well they'd all chip in and laugh or yes. <laughs> uh, and you know we try to we try to do it in a way that's fun that gets people mm -hmm. to engage with it so getting the skippers and first mates um to work together now um, they'd already selected the skippers, so we didn't get involved in the selection. And, you know, there's not a huge population yeah. of these people. And they want to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they have a spreadsheet which covers pretty much everything. So they try to make the, the yachts as equal as possible. So in terms of gender, English speaking, um, navigation experience, uh, yachting experience, age you know, a whole, I think there's 40 different headings on the spreadsheet, yeah. which, um, whereas uh, basically for, for us, we were just looking at, could we get skippers who could have a reasonable relationship with their AQP and not give uh, one team an unfair advantage by putting two very strong shapers together that might not... <laughs> that might not hit it off for the entire journey. So I'll, I'll just show you a little, it's probably, Please. yeah, the little grid, Matt. Um, so what we did, and I think uh, Joe's going to show you the candidate working relationship report. So these are all the skippers and first mates. So skippers on the left-hand side and AQPs. We've obviously... Um, taking their names names off to protect their uh, protect them, um, and what we did, we came up with. We looked at the candidate working relationships, we looked at their profiles, and we tried to grade them in terms of 
red red which would probably be a difficult relationship through to green green our goal was to try to get 11 combinations that were nothing worse than a green amber we okay. didn't quite manage to do that but you know this just shows you um the diversity and you can see you know there's a couple of aqps that you know they were quite difficult to match it's a bit um, red isn't there for a couple yeah. of them Actually, one's got eight yeah. one's got seven and one skipper so um you know it's it's just not always possible to get an exact match but right. i don't think we had anything worse than an amber amber relationship so that was that was kind of a breakthrough for us that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Even though, I mean, sometimes we, we, we can't have the ideal relationship. We haven't got the ideal relationship, but it's that language sometimes. It's actually being aware that that relationship isn't ideal and where those points are going to be, you know, where those pressure points can be, can be as useful as sometimes having, might, might be a perfect relationship. If you don't know it, you don't make the most out of it, do you? Yeah, and, and and I think, you know, when people realise this is not a personal thing, if they've had conflicts with a person, once yeah. they see each other's profiles and they think, wow, you know, it's not personal, this is kind of inevitable. Yes. Um, and if they're new to each other and you get them to share their profiles, uh, you know, we perhaps show them the candidate working relationship and we say, you know, this might not happen, but just be aware of it you know, at least, you know, it doesn't come as a shock when things get a little tense. Absolutely. So. And it is, isn't it? It's that, that awareness. So you start with yourself and then you look at the person you're working with and then the rest of the teams um, after that, don't you? I'm just going to show, actually, I'm just going to share screen a second. Um, we put these together just before this webinar because I suddenly thought people may not be aware of the working relationship reports. So the idea is that someone, somebody has completed their Melbourne self-perception inventory and hopefully observers, and we'll talk about that in a minute, Graham. Um, you can then look at that data and put it together and make some predictions based on the relationship about how they may work together. So mm. here we have Mrs. Peacock is the manager of Professor Plum. Um, and we can see that it's got the potential to be successful because Mrs. Peacock needs the meticulous attention and support that Professor Plum can provide. Um, and actually, the, uh, you know, they've got also the, the potential of um, contacts and opportunities coming in there as well. Um, and actually looking at those second team roles, it could be a good pairing, but that's not always the case. Hmm. Look at this one. Look at those second team roles there. It could be us, Graham. Actually, this yeah. could be us. Um, <laughs> although your plant's a lot higher, isn't it? Um, so yes. So potentially they may get on really well because they're outgoing. They've got that resource investigator, but that, that's a high shaper. Hmm. That could really be an issue. Um, what we have here is that the issues may be that because they are so completely different, you can see all the red and all the blue. The potential problem here could be the fact that they're just so different. They don't understand or value each other. Hmm. And um, they might have to learn to value each other. Yeah. Absolutely. So over here, somebody's saying, we've got a process, where's the detail, but also, you know, wanting to, to care and having the empathy, and somebody else is going ahead at 90 miles an hour, you know, mm. it's, <laughs> they need each other, but can they really appreciate one another? Yeah. I'm stop sharing that now. Somebody just made a really good, I know it in the oh, look, chat stop box. stop it, stop <laughs> it. <laughs> but somebody just made a really good observation, it kind of flashed up that reality TV, oh, um, is Amy, Amy is yeah. based on having reds. Yes. And that's absolutely true. Whereas uh, we're exactly the opposite true. here because, mm -hmm. you know, there are people's lives at stake. I mean, I know reality TV, there could be people's lives at stake in, in terms of emotional disruption. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think from the, a physical point of view and a safety point of view, it's paramount that we try to get the best relationships possible um, to give the crews the best chance of having a great experience. Um, you know, it's not necessarily about winning the race. It's just about how the leadership duo complement each other. And uh, Absolutely. Do you know, I really like that that Amy's put there, about that red it is, isn't it? We, we, we yeah. thrive on seeing that, don't we? We want to see that. We don't want to see everybody getting on because, you know, it's not as entertaining, no. um, is it? And that's a really good point. Thank you for that. Okay, so they do their Belbins. Observer assessments? 
Yeah, they. Yeah, Please. we always do observer assessments because, <laughs> yeah, a lot of the tools out there, and I, I'm not going to name any of them, and you know they are very very popular, and they are good, but they have no observer feedback. And I think was it Robbie Burns who said, "Oh, that some power would give us the power to see us as others see us," and I think that's what Belvin does. You know, it it. You can see how you see yourself. You can see how others see you. You can begin to understand why somebody might see you in that different mm -hmm. way, particularly mm -hmm. if you're a leader. Um, and, you know, That's exploring that comes. is really important. Yeah. Isn't it just, isn't it just? So you use Belvin to help along with all of these others and you are really looking to enhance the skills that these skippers um, and AQPs had. Mm -hmm. um, you're looking to make them the best they possibly can because, my God, they needed to be able to have that information at their fingertips for when you had things like that, like hurricanes, you know, and those little, you know, blips um, that happen when you're you're on the race. But how well did it work? Did it work? Could you measure it at all? Well, uh, I mean, the race obviously stopped half halfway round. Uh, we have um, we will be interviewing all the skippers and crew at the oh. end of the not all the crew but the uh, aqps at the end of the race and we will build up more data uh which will help us in you know developing the next the next race um so uh one example i think this is uh geronimo uh, we love geronimo um and his AQP is Ryan, which, and it was a clip from their yacht that you saw a few oh, moments yes, ago. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so this is his blog on day, I think it was day 15 blog, but the report came up on the 16th, uh, on day 16. So we were put together after completing some personality matching exercises by the race, by us. Uh, I don't know how they did it, but they got it spot on. So, and those two were just fantastic and i can share that was a green green relationship oh, so brilliant. um uh, but you know we've heard of lots of others where the relationship was fantastic um but you'll be able to build on that and perhaps give us some more data about how well it worked after they start again because this is what happened isn't it you had all of this opportunity you'd worked with the the clipper race i mean it just sounds so exciting you had the opportunity to really make a difference off they all go or being waved off at catherine docks and somebody who apparently was there you know and said it was really really exciting and then what happened last march well our perfect storm arrived uh, in march last year yeah so if you can imagine we run face-to-face -face training and i think We've worked in 20, 28 countries in the last five years. We have two leadership centres, one at St George's Park, which is the home of the England football teams, and the other one at Wakefield Park, uh, Wakefield Estate, which is near Reading. And both of our leadership centres were shut. All face-to-face -face training stopped. Um, our revenues dropped to 5%. And I often reflect now, you know, if I'd have seen our numbers now, you know, and didn't know what had happened with the pandemic, I would have thought we must have done something seriously illegal or, um, Wrong. you know, had a health yeah. and safety breach, or, yeah. you know, because our numbers wouldn't just drop by 95%. So they dropped so, by 95, jeez. Because everything we do dis disappeared. Mm. We had a bit of coaching that was left, which was online. So um, we decided very quickly that... We obviously needed to do something about this. So, and you know, my perception is there's three sorts of companies. There's companies who make things happen, who watch what happened, and then you've got some that wonder what happened. And we decided to be in the first group. So we took some really tough decisions. Uh, we decided to leave the office. I mean, we we own mm -hmm. the office and kind of rent it to ourselves, but we decided that everyone should work for home from home for their safety. Um, we decided to go paperless um, and we decided to move to virtual learning and uh, we then spent the next three months practicing in every way possible. Um, so, we, so before we go any further, whereabouts have you left the boats? 
Well, because the, they're still no. going around. The, where are they? <laughs> no, COVID the boats, happened. Where have they gone? The boats are stuck in the Philippines. Okay, so, so they're stuck there right now. Yeah, so yeah. they're stuck there, and you're stuck, all now working virtually. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted. I just suddenly thought I don't know where the boats are. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, the boats are in the Philippines, um, and Geronimo is the only skipper who is who is out there looking after the boats. Wow. So. Wow. Um, but yeah, so we decided because. Everything we do is experiential. And, uh, you know, we obviously have these leadership centers. We do, um, we do scenarios and simulations um, where we simulate businesses. Uh, we do lots of different problem solving exercises um, where companies, they participants set up fictitious companies and they have to generate revenue by completing problem solving tasks and uh, they earn half their money by um, successful achievement of the task according to the brief given the other 50 mm percent -hmm. for how they uh the, we call it a process which is how they communicate how they share information mm -hmm. how they make decisions how they run projects uh, how they talk to each other deal with difficult situations all of that stuff so they earn money by completing those things um and those enable them to purchase things to be able to complete customer goals yeah and these things run over two or three days and the things they have to solve might involve heights they might involve physical exercises they might involve non-physical paper and desktop creative exercises i mean they might for instance have to we have 200 fancy dress costumes and they're just they, tools, aren't they yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They, uh, they might have to put on a panto uh, that depicts the future of their company. Um, wow. Or they might have to get locked in a prison cell. Um, and uh, so sometimes they turn up at the police station and say, we've got to be locked up, assuming that we've told the police, but we haven't. And uh, oh my goodness. yeah, so there's lots of things like that. They might have to get on radio or um and so I this actually, was very much that the GRA experience, wasn't it? This is very much what, what you did when you weren't obviously helping the Clipper race. And suddenly, your perfect all storm, all gone. Yeah. So then all gone. we thought, right, what are we going to do? Um, and we thought experiential learning has made us successful for 30 years. And we've never had a turn down in revenue. So we thought, if we're going to do virtual, we've got to make it the same um, the same as we've done in the outdoors or face to face. So we came up with some principles, which Matt will share with you now. So we looked what's made us successful. And we thought we have to make a difference mm. to the company. They have to feel that they've got something out of it. This is not just fun team building where we go away and forget about it. We have to be flexible and that we have to design these things according to the needs of the client. Um, we've already said it has to be experiential. We try to touch emotions um, and we try to get people outside their comfort zone. So I don't mean that we beast them. You know, this is not a pre-entry test for the Marines. Um, you do not have to have a lobotomy <laughs> to come on one of our programs. Um, and it's all challenged by choice. So we do not force people to do things. If they want to challenge themselves, we do everything we possibly can mm -hmm. to enable them to get outside their comfort zone. So we provide the support and the help and obviously safety as well. Safety is paramount as it is on the Clipper race as well. Yeah. Um, it has to be memorable and we try to make it fun. So capturing all those principles, we then applied that to virtual. Okay. So you managed to take this and what you, you apply normally, you've been able to. And I think sometimes things like that, touching emotions is somewhat a bit more difficult, isn't it? I think when you're working virtually, but you've managed to overcome that. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we've now developed about 40 um, exercises, 40 or 50, well, probably slightly more than 40, different exercises where we'll input a bit of theory and then people go through a practical experience. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, 
and we try to bring in all the different aspects of a business. So they might be based on planning, it might be based on problem solving, decision making, communication, all of those kinds of things. And we also run virtual scenarios now. So they run over two or three days. And I mean, we just run one recently for FTSE 100 for their graduates. And um, we had 30 graduates and we have a scavenger hunt which crosses seven continents. Um, so they put in Google map references. We test them on all the learning that they've had throughout the previous year. Wow. They've already done 10 modules, but they also get tested on things about these continents, on the different continents mm -hmm. that they're in. Um, they do things like a wake up challenge where they have to get 40 things done within 40 minutes. And what is absolutely fantastic, particularly with these young grads, um, was how they work together. You know, we were switching from Teams to Adobe to WebEx. Um, they were using WhatsApp and just watching these young people move with technology, yeah. get results. And they had to deliver a project which was about how they could sell their sustainability project, um, their sustainability strategy globally across to all workers across this uh, um, wow. company. And they had to do a survey of uh, people and present back to the directors at the end. And it was, yeah, it was phenomenal. I was blown away. Yeah. It's incredible, isn't it, how the challenge of having to take something into a different um, platform, being able to take it from face to face um, to virtually. I know we found it quite scary, but we also had to do it. But then actually a lot of the insecurities are your insecurities, because a lot of the time you're working with people who just with it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of our challenges we've had. It's like, oh my God, I don't know what button to press. So nobody's going to know what button to press. <laughs> and actually, everybody else is geared up just wonderfully technically, aren't they? So the transition, sometimes it's our transition, isn't it, as opposed to um, mm -hmm. what, what the clients see. But we've just got a couple of minutes here, Graham. What I'd love you to take me through is you've got 10 behavioral principles, haven't you, that within GRA that really underpin what you do. And I think this is why, you know, people are looking at, you know, their own transitions into the online world, I think they might as well have a look at these because I think they're really, really good pointers. Yeah, uh, Matt, if we can put these back, we, we sat down and thought, we've been, I mean, I would say our productivity um, has gone up two or three times since working from home. And me being the age I, I am, and I can be ageist about myself, is uh, I probably resisted this. Um, so we had an office and everybody used to come in. And now it's, it is just completely different. And what we've been able to do, and we've, we sat down and thought, how have we done this? Um, we get small project teams. Everybody's aware of their Belvin profiles. We give them short deadlines. We get people to play to their strengths and learn how to mitigate their weaknesses mm -hmm. by pairing up with people that are different from them. We get them to describe the purpose of what they're doing. So what are you, you know, what's the purpose? You have to describe it in two or three sentences. And then we put a plan together and we meet regularly. And these plans are either on track green or off track red. And uh, you have to say whether you're on track or off track. If you're if you're off track, then if it appears two or three weeks running, then you know we we have a discussion and people manage it because it's so transparent. Yeah, we always have cameras on because we can sense how people are feeling, and you know watch the body language. No email chains. We do everything over the phone and on Teams. Um, we think first about how to become effective. What are we here to do? And then try to get good at it. Mm -hmm. So we find loads of companies that are efficiently ineffective. So they're very good at doing the wrong things. Yes. Um, and yeah, you can see the other things. We've tried to get rid of hierarchy. We yeah. always ask ourselves, how can we improve? And we have fun. Uh, we do bake-offs and 
quizzes and things like that, which, and everybody has the right to challenge um, to try and come up with a better solution. So, um, is a perfect you know the one of the reasons Graham that I wanted you to share these is one because I think they're great but I think this illustrates what brilliant teamwork looks like so people often say what how do you know if you've got a team it's when you've created the atmosphere and the, the level of psychological safety trust and all this for all these 10 principles to happen you've got small teams people you know they've got transparency they've got ownership they've got accountability this only happens, doesn't it? I think when you work at your team, um, and like you're saying, where you're finding people's strengths, you're making sure people are working to their strength, so hopefully more engaged. And I think there's something in the paper today that said engagement is going right down, even though productivity may be going slightly up. So it's really important, isn't it, to get that engagement level to ensure what people are doing is, is resonates with their strengths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. And so far, I mean, I think we've got a, an infographic um, about our virtual training, which uh, I, I would not have believed we were capable of doing this. And personally, I would not be capable of doing it. Um, you know, we've got a lot of people coming together with a whole range of talents that have enabled mm -hmm. us to deliver these stats, which I think, uh, yeah, been well, you need them. You need a, you need a, a, a pop up with them all in, don't you? Yeah, that's what you need, because I mean, they're phenomenal, Graham. I mean, that's really shown, hasn't it? It's illustrated not just your, the power of, of amazing teamwork, but your transition and your openness to make that um, going from face to face to to online. We have a couple of minutes now that I just like a couple of questions. So I'm sorry, I'm cutting. I'm being the shaper now. I've got my shaper hat back on. <laughs> no I've tried worries. to be so coordinator. I've really tried, but you can't do it all of the time. So. One thing that was, you know, asking is, is going back to the clipper race. And um, do you think you will be able to measure? I mean, on the legs that they did so far was, what was her name? Was it Tracy? Um, Sharon, who did they have less issues to deal with? Um, because the race is finished um, on, yeah, the other side of the world. Yeah. And I've managed to interview a couple of skippers. Um, uh, if I'm being totally honest, I, I don't know because I don't know all the stories yeah. yet. And yet, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that I, th I think we will have helped these people learn a lot and apply some skills. I mean, some people were having crucial conversations before yeah. they left St. Catherine's Dock. Yeah. Um, so I believe we help people a lot. Uh, they increased their self-awareness. Um, they learned a lot more about people and they, they, they were given a lot of skills. Now, whether five or six days is enough, I think. Um, oh, this is the burning probably. thing, isn't it? This is the burning thing. You always need more time with people, don't you? Yeah. Always. But I think if they do it, if they do it again, if they did it a second time, um, I have no doubt they'd be much well I think some of the people that have done it a second or mm. third time constantly improve their skills yeah um, and for a lot of people this is the start isn't it we're, we're never the finished article and what you're doing is giving them the skills um, with all of the different um, tools and everything that you use for them to be able to make that next step won't you um, mm -hmm. and it's never finished is it it's it's, it's ongoing so hopefully yeah. some of them have well not started on their leadership journey because like we say they were already you know really um, established in that area but really enhancing them and making sure they're making that last final stretch perhaps yeah there's a few other questions that have come in, but I think I'm going to just leave those for now because they're quite detailed. And I think we can probably answer those on the email that we send out tomorrow. So our hour's up. Wow. Graham, <laughs> I told you it'd go quickly, didn't I? I said it'll go ever so quickly, don't worry. Um, what I would love to just ask you, would you do it? Would you go on one of those? Uh, I, I thought I would. And um, I think if I was a little younger, I might. Um, I but I, I don't know if I would do the whole, the whole um, circumnavigation. Yeah. yeah, a couple I of legs, perhaps. 11 Easy months. Ones. So one leg or two legs, I might. <laughs> Fantastic. I was like, can I do the, the English Channel leg? Is there a leg that just... 
That was the, one of the worst ones, ironically. Oh, oh Actually, God, that's where they were all sick. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, Graham, thank you so much for joining us um, with our webinar today. It's been insightful. It really has. And I think to me, what it's done is the first book with the clipper race. It's made that theory actually how do you use it and my god how crucial it was that it was used properly and then the second leg for us is really how you as an organization have made that transition from such an outdoor face-to-face organization to really really grasping um, this virtual world that we now live in and those principles I love I might copy and paste those I might steal them for our company as well but um, feel free <laughs> Graham thank you so much indeed and thank you everybody for joining us we will be sending um, an email out with the recording and yes there's some people who may just be seeing us on that